Good morning, Woodruff Road Christian Church, friends, family, all of those that have come across as visitors to our YouTube channel. Uh, Chris here, happy to be a part of your Sunday morning worship routine uh, in, in what has become our new routine, our new normal, me talking to a camera, you watching this uh, on a phone, computer, or TV. Um, I am, no matter which way you are watching, I am thrilled to be a part of your Sunday morning and your worship now as we as we figure out this social distancing and flattening the curve and whatever hot words you'd like to use to um, talk about it right now. I just know that we're not together, and so this is uh, this is where we are, and I am thrilled and honored to be a part of your Sunday morning and your worship uh, today as we get into the Word. Uh, we're, we're starting off on a new mini-series now. This is a, a change of plans. This is something that uh, hadn't really thought about doing until about a week or so ago when I realized what I had planned was much more fitting for an audience that could actually you know, go outside, could uh, actually uh, do some other things that, that we're limited on right now. And so after some discussion, we decided that uh, where we needed to land, at least for just a little bit longer here, is, is something that would be familiar, something that would be comforting, although I'm never really, you know, good with us being fully comfortable, you know that. Uh, but something that we can use and talk about that will give us some peace and give us some of that uh, God is near comfort that we so desperately need when things are so weird and wonky. And so what we're doing, uh, without any further delay of talking about our topic without actually talking about our topic, which I'm surprisingly good at, still doing it, is we're going to talk about Psalm 23. Very familiar chapter of the Bible, very familiar song. Uh, every time I start talking about it, I think about the days that when I actually started learning uh, Psalm 23. I remember this being the first memory verse or you know memory verses that I was challenged to memorize. Uh, I was in third grade, and I still remember the classroom. I still remember the prize. It was a green squirt gun. Nailed it. Got that screen, green squirt gun. And I think I lost it or broke it before I'd even made it home. But anyways, I still have great memories of, of internalizing this scripture. And, and I have comfort from it. And so I want to spend the next at least three weeks walking through a couple verses a week with Psalm 23. And so this sermon this week actually is a big callback to a sermon which I'm sure all of you remember very specifically. It was October 14th. 2018. Um, we all can remember that very specifically right now in that sermon this morning. I actually, we were talking about God is bigger than this. When we were talking through our God is bigger than this, especially fear um, series, we talked about God is bigger than our fear of lack. And that's a big uh, concept that uh, we've talked about in our short devotional videos, uh, daily videos on our YouTube channel, and something that I want to revisit again this morning. So we're going to look at something very familiar. Again, Psalm 23. I want us to find some comfort and always find some challenge in this most popular psalm of David. Here it is, Psalm 23. I'm going to read all six verses. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Like I mentioned, we're going to look at verse 1 and verse 2 this week. That's where we're going to camp up. So let's look at breaking those two down uh, into some bite-sized morsels. First, the Lord is my shepherd. And so what is that statement communicating to us? The Lord is my shepherd. Who needs a shepherd? Sheep do. 
Therefore, we are sheep, looking at the, the equation that's being set up for us. If the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I am a sheep. The second port, part, I have all that I need. Therefore, this shepherd, this shepherd understands me. This shepherd understands you. This shepherd knows us, knows his flock, and provides exactly what we, his sheep, need. Third, uh, he lets me rest and he leads me beside. These are the actions of the shepherd. He's walking in front of us with that understanding of our needs, of our desires, of our wants, of our identities, of our limits, how far we can walk until we can walk no further, until we must have sustenance, water, food. We have a shepherd who understands us. We have a shepherd who gets us. And finally, the the fourth breakdown of these two verses, it, it talks about where he leads us, green meadows and beside peaceful streams. He knows those needs. He knows what we need. He has not abandoned us, nor will he abandon us to isolation, to threat, to hunger, to thirst. And he brings us ultimately peace. That's a lot to communicate in just two verses. It's what David is saying. He's, he's singing this out to God. He's laying this out. And we have, have been able to look at this chapter, this song, for so long. And here is all the things that he is communicating to us. And so let's walk through this. Let's find ourselves with the peace of the shepherd this morning. So we start really with this understanding that we are sheep. Now, if you know anything about sheep, that's kind of an insult. Uh, The life of a sheep is not a hard life. Um, Now, it's not nearly as taxing as maybe that of a cat. But definitely, it's along the lines of low stress when there's a good shepherd nearby. So let's chew on this a bit because um, if you think about it, And if we understand this, and we need to understand this, sheep will only thrive and survive when they are shepherded. When there is a shepherd. You see, in essence, sheep have the good life because they're guided to food. They are guided to water. They are sheared when the wool gets too heavy. They are protected because they are an investment worth investing in. One sheep wanders off getting in its head that there's better food there. The shepherd uses his staff to bring it back, but it's always in a gentle way. When the shepherd's on the job, when the shepherd is caring for the sheep, they have everything that they need. So in other words, the sheep have a good life when the shepherd does his job. When the shepherd does his job, the sheep trust the shepherd and life is good. Now I think you hopefully get where I'm going here. We are sheep. And in one sense, especially in this sense, because we know the shepherd, that is comforting. We have a shepherd who loves us. We have a shepherd who cares for us. But in the same breath, we have to acknowledge this. We are sheep. You look at sheep behavior patterns. And maybe we can understand this as the insult that it is because of what is inferred when we are labeled as such, sheep. But also, I don't want this to be an insult. I want this to be something that's comforting because the promise that Christ has made to be our shepherd. From the Sheep 101 website, that's literally the name of the website, Sheep 101. Sheep are flocking animals with strong instincts to follow the sheep in front of them. So the fact that if one goes... All will follow. It doesn't matter which member of the flock leads. There's no hierarchy here. The rest will follow. So if one walks over a cliff, the rest will follow. So yes, that age-old question, if one sheep jumps off a bridge, would you? The answer is yes. Sheep will spend up to eight to nine hours eating. There's the good life. Uh, If food is prevalent, if food is scarce, they'll spend up to 13 hours looking for food and trying to eat it. They will not stop eating unless they're led away from the temptation of food. 
And when they are being led by the shepherd, if the path they are on appears to be a dead end, say a curve, they will stop and not move forward. Now don't be confused. Sheep are not stupid. They have some base set instincts. They're a very smart animal. It's, it's just that those instincts for food and self-preservation are, are not very well refined for life without a shepherd. I think we may be able to bring it home right here. We could probably stop and, and, and finish with this. Uh, we are sheep. We have a good shepherd. How often have we wandered off on our own thinking there's better food over there? How often have we stopped in our tracks because we can't see where we're going even though the shepherd is driving us along, even though he is in front of us? Without the shepherd, the sheep are lost. Now, each week, as we walk through this sermon series, short sermon series, uh, I want to have some connecting points. And you can pick the one connecting point we're making right now uh, with Jesus' I am statement, I am the good shepherd. We'll read that in a second. But I want to look at two connecting points each week. First, with an I am statement. A statement of who Jesus is and who Jesus promises to be in our lives. And second, an application teaching point from the Sermon on the Mount, how Jesus presents our behavior, our response to this world, and how we are to respond to this world. So application. So two connecting points, first from John, second from Matthew. So let's look at that obvious I am statement today that connects us to Psalm 23. It's John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. We must be reassured by this. We must, because we desperately need a shepherd. When we acknowledge our place as sheep, we make the declaration that we need a shepherd. Now, we will look for a shepherd. We will look for a shepherd. That may not be Christ. That may be money. Money can be our shepherd. Politics can be our shepherd. Fill in the gap. We are looking for a shepherd. We are looking for something to give us direction that we can follow confidently with a hope and understanding. We need a shepherd. Now we'll look soon at the full context of Jesus' statement in John chapter 10 soon, but I want to bring us all together here in the Psalms. I want to look at the context of David writing this psalm because there's a statement that David makes in here that is far more profound even than the, the Lord is my shepherd and calling for a shepherd or calling ourselves sheep. And it's what follows that. I have all that I need. There is an understanding from David about what being a sheep really means. And there's a level of contentment from David that we must strive for. And that is where the challenge for this sermon comes from. I have all that I need. Because I'm a sheep, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. And that is the basis for the meat of our sermon. We have three points that we're going to look at that this establishes in the life of a sheep. The first is trust. Trust in the shepherd. The second is understanding the shepherd's actions, motives, and leadings. And third is this concept of enough. Enough. So first, trust. We must know David's context for the Psalms fully to understand the power of trust he is exhibiting here. Because if we don't, if we're not careful, we will change the meaning of that verse 1. If we're not careful. It is about need, not want. You see, our image of God changes when we think he must give us everything we want. Our image of God turns upside down if that's how we consider him. See, David trusted the Lord as his shepherd. Long before Jesus made that statement of who he is and his purpose with the sheep, David trusted the shepherd, the Lord, 
his good shepherd, and he had everything he needed. And, and there's a temptation, I, and I'm going to acknowledge this and because I'm guilty of this. When I read this and I think, well, David, of course David's going to say, I have all that I need. He's the king. Who, what king doesn't have all that they need? Money, thrones, big rooms to make your voice go booming in and, and make declares and have absolute law at your command. David was a king. David was rich. David was powerful. David was handsome. David had this. David had this. David had this. Remember, the context of most of these psalms is not from the throne. It's from the cave. It's from the wilderness. It's from isolation and fear and hopelessness and abandonment and betrayal and running for his life. This is pre-King David. He knew what it was like to have nothing. He knew what it was like to be alone. He knew what it was like to be betrayed and running for his life. And yet David claims, and I believe him, that he had everything he needed. Everything. He trusted God to provide. When he was in isolation, which sounds familiar. When times were scary, sounds familiar. And when he was not exactly sure what the next few weeks, months, and year would play out, how they would play out, again, sounds familiar. He trusted God to provide. He had a level of trust in God's plan that he would go where God led. And this calls us to our application point number one from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. I'm going to start with the second half of verse 8. Your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. When we pray like this, when we apply this trust in the good shepherd, we trust God to be holy, sustaining, present and attentive, and faithful to us. We in this time of fear, can trust God to be God. We are not, but He is. And we have all that we need. The second aspect of what David knew was understanding. David knew what he needed. Now again, if we are not careful, we must establish this line between need and want. Because if we don't have a strong, established line between need and want, we will become entitled and self-righteous. Henry Blackaby writes in Experiencing God Day by Day. He wrote this, Have you allowed your focus to shift from the shepherd to what the shepherd gives you? If you find yourself wanting, it is not that your shepherd is unable or unwilling to perfectly meet your needs. It may be that you lack the faith to receive all that he has to give. Could it be that you have become dissatisfied with what your shepherd has been providing? Are you missing the joy that comes from having a shepherd who cares for you? We have a good shepherd. And he understands what we need. That is a big point of knowledge, of faith for the believer. That God understands us. He is not distant. He is not too far uh, removed from us to know that we are human. That we are, well, sheep. He will not leave us hanging. Look at Jesus' words to the poor and the needy and the oppressed and the persecuted. As we continue in Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read two verses, verse 26 and 27. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them, and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Yes, 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 we get it. We're, we're more valuable than the little birds. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And we have a God who is faithful to his promises 
every time. Every time. I have an exercise for you that I would love for you to do right here, right now. And pause the video if you need some time. In fact, I'd like for you to pause the video after I have you with this question, answer this question. Think backwards in time to the times God has provided for you. Think about a time when it was God who provided for you. And then think further back to what you were thinking or feeling right before God provided for you. You see, we tend to remember the lack more than the receiving. Take some time to think about that right now. Talk about it amongst yourselves, whoever you're gathered with. Did you, we'll be did right. you talk about that? I hope you did. That's not just a, a, an awkward pause in the sermon. It's something that I want us to be thinking about because in order to know, we must know. See, God is faithful. He will keep his promises here, now. We must trust him. We must understand his perspective of the difference between want and need. He is the good shepherd. He is calling us. And he has everything we need. We no longer need to be afraid of not having enough. Everything we need is in the hands of a good shepherd. Which leads us to our third point of faith and knowledge that David has in Psalm 23, verse 1 and 2. And that's the concept of enough. At this point of our pandemic isolation and social distancing, even cool streams and green meadows sound pretty great. Uh, certainly sound a lot better than uh, lumpy couch cushions and tap water. Cool streams and green meadows means we're outside. We're outside. That would actually mean we've gone somewhere. And that sounds pretty great. But when things get back to normal, which they will, will we still feel that way? Will we still feel as though God truly has enough for us? Will we be content with what God has provided for us. Sometimes that looks like cool meadows, cool streams, and green meadows. I almost said cool meadows and green streams, which does not sound appealing at all. Will we still find contentment in the simple things? Will we still find contentment in God to provide for us when we can get back to providing for ourselves? Will our definition of blessing go back from God is sustaining me to gimme, 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 gimme? I want, I want, I want. Will our level of need escalate back up to the levels of want and I deserve an entitlement? We must be content and still enough to know that God is God. And he is going to give us everything we need. He already has. And he said this, I am the good shepherd. Because the shepherd knows us. And we can trust him. We can trust him. Because he understands what we need. He understands the difference between need and want. And he gives us enough. His grace is sufficient for us. Living water. The bread of life. I want to read John chapter 10, verse 11 through 15. The full statement of Jesus being the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. We have the Good Shepherd. We have all that we need, because he will provide, and he will remain faithful. Remember the sacrifice of the Lord as we take communion together, as we gather around that table, as we look forward to gathering around the Lord's table again together in person. Remember, trust, trust the Good Shepherd because the Good Shepherd understands us and the Good Shepherd has enough for us. Be blessed, Woodruff Road Christian Church and friends. More importantly, be the blessing this world so desperately needs. See you soon.